The Lord be with you. I want to invite you to turn in your copy of Scripture to the second chapter of Luke's Gospel. As you turn there, one of Pat's comments this morning made me think of a sermon I heard in seminary once. The preacher in chapel said, Some of you this morning feel like the third verse in a Baptist church. (laughs) And we all started looking around and he goes, You know, left out. (laughs) And so I said, You can always keep that one in your back pocket. Make sure you credit it to me. And, uh, any royalties come to my family. That sort of thing. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20, is what we'll be reading this morning. <clears throat> Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. In those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration that was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, where he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. May God bless the reading and hearing. Of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Lord, now I pray that we hear your words speaking to us through Holy Scripture. Whatever words I may place in the way, God, on this Christmas morning, may they be quickly forgotten so that your words call us to do and be the people you call us to be. In your name we pray. Amen. Let me ask you, have you ever read a book, really liked the book, got into the book, kept it on the shelf, maybe read it more than once, and then after you read it so many times, you heard Hollywood's making a movie about it. And so you get excited. You see the previews. You go, oh, this looks like it'll be pretty good. And so you decide, uh, against your better judgment, to pay the unholy price for an evening ticket to the movie, which now there are credit applications at some of the windows, I heard. (laughs) You forego that, that, that garbage bag of popcorn, the gallon of soda. They tell you, by the way, when they give you that, oh, it's free refills on this $15 Coke, but it's a gallon. It doesn't matter. And you find your way into the middle of the dark theater. You sit there. You sit through the previews, sit through 90 minutes, maybe two hours, of what you had hoped would be this cinematic masterpiece of, of someone's understanding of this great work that you love so much. And when the credits roll, you just sit there and you go, that ain't at all what it was supposed to be like. That's not what it was supposed to be. That's not how it ends. That's not the way they look. That's not what's supposed to happen. Don't you just hate that? The only exception to that rule, by the way, is Forrest Gump. If you read the book, the movie's way better, way better. But, you know, I I wonder if the biblical authors and their original audiences would feel the same way if they had a chance to witness some of our sort of theatrical interpretations of Scripture. 
I mean, how do you think uh, the writer of John's Gospel the, uh, would feel about Mel Gibson's portrayal of Jesus? Or, or, or what might Moses think? Would he prefer Charlton Heston or Christian Bale in their interpretation? Or, or how would any of the writers of the New Testament feel about that, about that peculiar musical Jesus Christ superstar? I mean, do you think Mark would be, yeah, that's what I meant. It's hard to say. But I do think that perhaps Luke would take some objection, maybe, to the ways that we dramatically interpret this portion of his story, especially about these shepherds. I mean, I can just see him now, seated somewhere in the middle of any given sanctuary at this time of year. Perhaps the children's ministry is performing some sort of passion play, some pageant, some nativity play, complete with an angry innkeeper, a live goat, uh, Sister Sue's grandbaby starring as the baby Jesus. And Luke is trying hard to sit still in the pew, really trying hard. He's twitching with anxiety as he watches his intellectual property being bent to the breaking point. And just when it seems like he's going to settle down, just when he's like, okay, it's an interpretation, that's fine, the shepherds walk onto the stage. Never mind the magi. Luke has no idea who those people are, where they came from. Luke would say, if you want to mess up the story, stick some rich kings in it from somewhere far off. Never mind that. But when the shepherds show up, boy, Luke loses it. I can almost hear him leaping out of the pew. No, no, you got it all wrong. They weren't cute. They weren't wearing bathrobes. They didn't have sheets. These were shepherds. You got it all wrong. And you know, I think he might be right. After all, Luke did write it down. But even if our interpretation is a bit romanticized, what exactly are we missing when we think about these folks? I mean, these shepherds really don't play that big of a role in the story, do they? I mean, the answer is probably in what Luke tells us, or maybe what he doesn't tell us. Do you notice the way he describes them? Or rather, the way he doesn't describe them? He simply says, they're shepherds. There's no narrative embellishment regarding the way they look. He doesn't say, there were shepherds with long beards, they were little boys. He doesn't say any of that stuff. He doesn't say how many there were. He doesn't say how they smelled. None of those things. Luke simply says, in that region, there were shepherds living in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night. And while there are many good arguments regarding the symbolism of these shepherds, uh, of having shepherds watching sheep in Bethlehem, you know, David was a shepherd watching sheep in Bethlehem, or, or how they, they were a part of the economy of that ancient Israelite community, it's most likely for Luke, a, a Gentile, that they are simply a personification of those to whom Luke dedicates the focus of his entire gospel. The poor, the outcast, the third verse folk, the marginalized. Throughout Luke's gospel, we see an emphasis on Jesus' teachings regarding the poor, women, Gentiles, folks others would just call sinners. One could argue that Luke, Luke's Jesus has a preferential option for the poor and downcast. One might even argue that the whole Bible, God seems to have a preferential option for the poor. I tend to think that he does. Therefore, it's likely these rather enigmatic shepherds are meant to stand as a sort of symbol for everyone who would have read or heard Luke's gospel, particularly this part. That's their role. They act as a sort of placeholder in Luke's gospel, setting up the audience from the very beginning. They are a symbol for all the people to whom the gospel is given. In fact, it's even reflected in the angel's words in verse 10. Do not be afraid, the angel says. You know, angels always have to say that because when they show up, they don't look like chubby little fat babies. They're, they're terrifying. They're angels. They're messengers from God. Do not be afraid, he says. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. This good news, the angel says, is not for just a few, not for one nation, not for one people, but for all People. It's not the sole property of the shepherds. It's not the sole property of Israel. It's not the sole property of the certain people. It's for everybody. And with the inclusion of the shepherds, Luke has invited us to take part in the birth of the King of Kings. Therefore, we ought to invite all people to the manger, to the cradle which holds the light of the world and the hope for all humankind. Christmas, the birth of Christ, 
is for all the people. But there's something further, I think, to learn from the shepherds. Luke includes them as a symbol, yet he doesn't just leave them in the fields watching their flocks. I mean, the angel doesn't just show up and say, hey, everybody, pay attention, don't be afraid. This thing has happened, and they go, wow, that's pretty good, that's good news. Can we change the channel, watch something else in the sky? No. Luke doesn't leave them in the field. They head towards Bethlehem, toward the feed box, which holds the bread of life. Verse 15, they say to one another, Hey, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They are moved and motivated by curiosity to seek out the sign about which they've been told. They were not told how far they have to go. We don't know if they're right next door, if they're across town, or way over in the other county. We're not told. Luke just says, They hurried off, found Mary, found Joseph, found the baby who was lying in the manger. The angel told them that this means in the town of David, a Savior is born, the Messiah, the Lord. And this is the sign that he's born and wrapped in cloths. This baby is the Savior. That's pretty amazing. And they go, what emotions these shepherds must have felt when they came upon this humble scene in Bethlehem. There, in that manger, there, an odd place for a baby, not just any baby, the Son of God. And Luke goes on to tell us that when they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. Now, right here, I don't want you to get confused. Don't be mistaken by the translation of these verses. These shepherds did not run out and tell everyone about the birth of Jesus. No, they told everyone around there, around the stable, what the angels had told them. I mean, they had to explain themselves. How many people do you know go around at night looking for strange babies laying in feed boxes? They need to explain themselves. They had to find the baby. And then when they did, they had to tell everybody, oh, this is how we knew about him in the first place. And everyone was amazed. I can hear the conversation around it. Shepherds show up. Yeah, yeah, we were out in the field. An angel shows up. Hey, Joe, come here. Get a load of this. These shepherds were just sitting out in the field, and an angel showed up with a choir and told them where we'd be and told them we'd be. Isn't that something? Here they are. Weren't you that way the first time that you realized who Jesus was? I mean, really realized who Jesus was, that you were amazed. Like these shepherds who, after they heard this wonderful news, they sought out Christ. I hear about him. I want to see him. Weren't you that way when you first heard about him? And when you found him, did you not tell everybody around you, hey, oh yeah, I'm living different now. I'm off the bottle. I got Jesus. I'm not cussing no more. I got Jesus. You told everybody around you, I got Jesus. I'm doing this. Everybody. Everybody want to know, where you been on Sunday? I've been at church. I got Jesus told everybody around you. It was like that feeling you have, well, on a day like today in the morning when you were a child. You saw those gifts under the tree, and so you tore through the paper, excited about what was inside, and once you unwrapped it, what'd you do? I got a Nintendo! And you ran around the room, Mama, I got a Nintendo! Dad, I got a Nintendo! And you just ran around the room so excited. And then what'd you do? You sat down, what's next? What's next? That's how we are sometimes with Jesus. Maybe we play with it for a little while. Eventually, it goes away. Finding Christ is like that for some folks, you know. But how I wish it wasn't. You see, these shepherds, they're so caught up in that initial wonder of what they had found, so caught up in that Christmas morning feeling, yet Luke tells us in verse 20 that all they did, the shepherds, Return. They went back home. I can't even begin to count the number of times in my family on Christmas morning when I've seen a child receiving a gift with excitement and anticipation only to find it laying in some forgotten pile a few minutes later. They're so thrilled that they have received a gift from someone, so happy that they have something so special, yet it doesn't take long. For the new to wear off and complacency to find its way back in. And sadly, that's the way it is with so many of us around this time of year. But surely the shepherds weren't like this. 
I mean, surely Luke meant to tell us. Maybe he meant to tell us that they ran back to town like some ancient Paul Revere, shouting, salvation is here. The Messiah is coming. The Messiah is here. He's in Bethlehem. He's in a cradle. Go, go see him. No. All we're told is that they went back home. They went back to the way things were. I mean, couldn't Luke have just maybe embellished it a little bit, maybe mentioned at least one of them in the latter portions of the gospel, maybe one of them standing there as a bystander during Luke's sermon on the plain, his version of the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe they could have been standing there and Luke said, oh, and there was one of the shepherds from Bethlehem. No. Maybe he could have at least given them uh, some sort of uh, a cameo in the second volume in Acts. There at Pentecost, as tongues of fire came down, oh, there was one of the shepherds who was there at Jesus' birth. No. He doesn't do that. You know, there's not even a tradition about the shepherds outside of here. Nobody in the fourth century sat down and said, hey, you know somebody who hadn't been talked about? The shepherds, and they sat down. No. They even gave the magi names. But nothing. Nothing for the shepherds. They just simply disappear. They're never heard from again. I wonder if we're like that. That we receive the good news. We feel that overwhelming joy of salvation. That overwhelming Christmas feeling. And yet when the new wears off. Do we just go back to the way things were? Go back to the way they were before we knew Jesus? I want to challenge you this morning, this Christmas morning, as you go from this place, as you go back to have dinner with family and friends, as you return to exchanging gifts, watching Christmas movies, drinking cider, hot chocolate, whatever, don't let things simply go back to the way they were. Don't let them go back to the way they were before Christmas. Don't let the feelings, the emotions, the reality of the birth of Christ be stored away with the Christmas ornaments. Embrace the fullness of what Christmas means. Hope, peace, joy, and love. It's not just a time to rekindle those seasonal feelings and convictions. Christmas is the jumping off point. It's literally the birth of the good news. So this Christmas, pick up where the shepherds left off. Don't simply go back to the way things were before the season. But allow the love of God to change the very way you live each and every day hereafter. Let Christ be born in your heart in such a way that you will not want to just simply return home to the way things were. But in such a way that you will seek daily to live those words from the angel. That you will seek to be one whose very life says to everyone, Do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. May you be one who gives the gift of God's love to all people every single day by your words and works of hope, peace, joy, and love. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, On this day when we celebrate your birth, help us, Lord, to have your spirit to encourage us and challenge us, to remind us, Lord, that this day is the beginning and not just one day that we celebrate every year, but a day that calls us ever on each day to share the spirit that we even have now of hope, peace, joy, and love. Move among us now, Holy Spirit, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.